Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank you, Dave, for the kind of opportunity to come here to talk about this recent paper that uh, we just published. In. This one was 2013 in Climate Dynamics. And this one is just appearing in June of Climate now in January 2014. Uh, in fact, in, in, in 2000, one, when I moved to Germany to, to get my PhD, the idea was to, to, to understand, the thesis was to understand the main mechanism responsible for leading the LGM climate, or, I mean, the less glacial maximum climate that occurred something like 20,000 years ago. So when you use a coupled model to evaluate all this forcing, CO2 forcing, astronomical forcing, and the topography and albedo forcing during that time. Uh, nevertheless, since then, we, I have done some experiments with coupled models, but with simplified coupled models. And in 2012, some papers appeared trying to, to, to with reconstructions of Antarctic topography for different time slices in the past year of history. And what we did first was try to simulate the mid Miocene climate uh, based on, on a very hypothetical topography file. Some uh, reconstructions uh, argue that the Antarctic topography in Antarctica, something like between 20 and 70 million years ago, was between 25 and 30 percent less than what we have present day. So in this paper, we just reduce this height of the Antarctic ice sheet by 25 percent and simulate for a thousand years. Uh, with a global climate coupled model, what happened this. In this publication, the, the idea was, in fact, to include in our coupled version of the model a real topography as reconstructed with ice sheet models by Polar and De Conto in 2000, I think 2009. And the main idea is they try to reconstruct the marine isotope stage 31 that happened something like one million years ago. And during this time, the West Antarctic ice sheet will collapse it completely. So the idea is to evaluate how this change in Antarctic topography lead to change in the Earth climate, okay? But one thing that it's interesting when we try to understand climate change, this is a picture that, that I, I saw in the Smithsonian Museum in, in New York, in, in, in Washington. You know what, this is very interesting because this is the, the, the brain size, something like 100,000 ago. And this is the brain size around 26,000 years ago. So we clearly see here the increase, in expanding brain size during this time. And this picture claims that the increase in brain size is associated with this climate variability. This is the uh, uh, proxy of temperature changes. Uh, I'm not sure if this is in, in Greenland, but here we can see between 30 and 20,000 years ago, this increase in variability as compared with the past climate here. So when they claim that this change in the, in the temperature leads to anomalous climate change that forced the human beings to increase the brain size due to the needs for looking for different things like foods and adapt for this climate. So and this is interesting. And so I can say that we can learn from the past. That's why we can move a little bit back to try to understand the future, like some global warming association. So the, the point, what I explore here is that the Antarctica has varied substantially in the Earth climate history. Huh? For instance, as I told you, during the Miocene, changes in the ice and Antarctic ice sheet changed from 50% to 155% compared with present day values. Another very interesting period, as I told, the, the, this marine isotope stage 31 has a, a complete collapse of the, uh, the, of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Another interesting point is that this change may induce substantial change in meridional heat transport in the ocean due to the change in the deep water formation. So, when do we explore some of these? Uh, ideas based on our modern experiment. The first thing I'd like to show you is that this is the F paleogeography. Huh? In the Permian period, 
And the Triaski, that this is the when the, the Lindsay sea configuration was characteristic, like 225 million years ago. This is the CO2 concentration characteristic of that of those period. And you can see here that despite this high concentration of CO2, 900 ppm, we still have some ice sheet in Antarctica. And this is claimed to be associated with the very strong autonomic forcing that allows to, to have these really cooling conditions in Antarctica uh, that was associated with the increase in this, in this uh, with the increase in the this ice sheet. Nevertheless, based on, with the same configuration, when we increase the CO2 concentration, almost double characteristics of the Permian, the ice sheet is gone. So clearly indicating that the CO2 effect has a very strong forcing on the ice sheet. In the Jurassic period, we also have this, this very similar configuration, but since the CO2 is higher, we do not allow the Antarctica ice sheet to, to grow. When we have, for instance, in the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago, when we have very close configuration that we have on, on, in, in, on the present day conditions, we still do not have the ice sheet, Antarctic ice sheet. No, again, because we have this high concentration of CO2. Before, I, I would say, in, during the 90s, most part of, of papers claim the, the appearance of the West Antarctic ice sheet due to the opening of these oceanic gateways like this, the Drake Passage, and those one here in the Indonesia. They say that this opening was associated with a reduction in the southern heat transport. And this reduction allows for the Antarctica, West Antarctica sheet to build up. What's happened is people could not reproduce the increase of the Antarctica sheet only by change the paleogeography. What it means that the amount of heat that was not transported to the south is not enough to cool the Antarctica and allows the, the, the West Antarctica sheet to grow. So what the uh, people found, like for instance, the Conto and Polar in 2009 or 2011, they claimed that in order to have the Antarctica sheet, the amount of CO2 concentrations should get down than 1,000 ppm. Otherwise, you do not have the possibility to have the Antarctic ice sheet due to the melting summer. So associated with the opening of the oceanic gateways was necessary also to have this decline in the CO2 concentration. That happens exactly between 35 and 25 million years ago. What you know that the Antarctic ice sheet will start to grow around 20, 35 years, million years ago. What exactly fits in this curve here associated with this effect of CO2. So there's another proof that the CO2 effect is a strong force to lead climate change. And also is, uh, is very uh, much associated with the growing and decay of the uh, ice sheets. Okay? And here they try to reconstruct the sea ice, the, the ice sheet topography. Yeah? during from 100,000, 100 million years ago to present. So until 35 million years ago, the ice, Antarctic ice sheet was very ephemeral. It grows and melts very fast because the CO2 concentration here plays a very uh, a leading role. However, from 35 million years ago to now, this has been more stable due to the characteristic value of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So this kind of, of uh, topography reconstruction can be implemented in, the, in, in coupled models to try to understand how was the climate characteristic of each of these periods in the history. So what we, do, we did was just use some of them to understand how the climate changed during these periods. Okay? Nevertheless, when we, we look for IPCC, this is IR4, the the uh, IPCC report, we can see that these two areas in Antarctica are very vulnerable. The West Antarctic ice sheet and this part of Antarctica. Not many problems 
has been associated with the interior of the, of the Greenland ice sheet. If you look at topography, one million years ago, we can see very similar characteristics. This part of, of the ice sheet was absent. So you have water here, open water here, and op also open water here. This was what has been constructed by, reconstructed by uh, ice sheet models. So in this topography here, can be assumed somehow similar to what we can expect in the last 200 years in Antarctica, if we still have this increase in temperature, especially in the West Antarctic ice sheet. So from the past, we can have some ideas what can happen in the future in terms of the climate. So that was the idea in including this topograph file in the couplet model. Which model we use? We use this model called SPIDO. SPIDO because SPIDI is the atmospheric component. It's from the ICTP in Italy, in Trieste. Nevertheless, we use a, version, a, 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 a modified version by the guys from, from Holland in the KNMI, that they improve a little bit the radiative force associated with the CO2. Because the original version of SPIDI, the parametrization of the radiative balance is a little bit weaker as compared with GCMs. Okay? And you use a full ocean model called CLIO. That's a model from Belgium, from the Louvain la Neve University. So this model is couplet, include also sea ice. And the most important thing that I, would, I, I should say about the CLIO is that a full GCM. However, it has a, a little coarse resolution because it has three by three degrees. So we run the model for 1,000 years. The horizontal resolution of the atmosphere is like T42. 80 layers in the vertical. That's why it's really fast. We can run, for instance, 100 years in a, in a MacBook. What well, is good? Because you cannot run this kind of experiment for 1,000 years with the CCSM, for instance. You take three months. The horizontal uh, the resolution of the oceanic components is three by three. It has 20 layers in the in the vert in the vertical. So this is a, a reasonable oceanic model. And to simulate the climate characteristic of the marine top stage, we use initial and boundary conditions present day. Why use that? Because the CO2 concentration one million years ago was very similar than we have in the present day conditions, like 309 ppm. The difference in, in, in these initial and boundary conditions are more associated with the astronomical forcing, because the astronomical forcing at that time has a very strong seasonal cycle in the southern hemisphere. So when we are doing this experiment, what, what uh, we are really evaluating the effect of topography associated with changes in the Western Antarctic ice sheet. So we cannot say that this experiment here is, in fact, an experiment that is reproducing the climate mi one million years ago because we have the absence of these two forces, the astronomical forcing and the sea level change. Okay? So this is the main change that we, we include in the, in the model. What's happened when we change the, the West Antarctic ice sheet? The first thing that we need to know if the model reliability, the model reliability, reliability to reproduce the present day climate. So what it did, what it did was to compute the first principal, uh, the first principal harmonic to see the variability to evaluate if the model is able to reproduce the seasonal cycle properly. And what we found when compare the speedo with the any separate analysis that the model does a good job when you compare in the global pattern. Huh? We have seen this huge seasonal cycle here that's also observed here in North America. In some parts of South America it, and Africa, it's okay. So we think that for evaluating the temperature change, this model is okay. When we evaluate the surface winds, the model does a reasonable job as well in the tropics, but has some problems here in Antarctica. So, Something like the model has very strong winter winds that does not appear here in the 
reanálise só. The main cause for this strong winds in the southern hemisphere, as reproduced by the model, is because it's the, the coupled version of Speedo has very thick uh, sea ice in the southern hemisphere. And this increases the meridional thermal gradient between the extra tropics and the polar latitudes, and this intensifies the winds due, due to the thermal wind relation. So that is the, is the main problem that we found here. But when we compare, for instance, the global pattern of winds, we can see that the model uh, uh, can, can reproduce the main important features of the winds as reproduced by the reanalysis, as you can see here. You see, the problem, this is the arrow, we have this increase magnitude generally, as I said, in summer here, okay? That's the main problem, but this is only the atmospheric version. When you couple this, the main problem is not associated with the summer in the southern hemisphere, but with winter due to the sea ice, okay? So based on this, we, we also evaluate the annual mean, and you can see here the precipitation field, and here the GPCP observations. And also, in terms of temperature, that's fine. This tells us that the main point when we try to, to evaluate this kind of experiments that are very long experiments, is to figure out if the model can reproduce the main meridional features of the climate, the zonal mean. Because particular uh, uh, characteristic of the climate, like grid point, this cannot be evaluated with this kind of model. So in this sense, we are really interested on understanding how climate change globally, and not specifically in one side. When we start the simulation from zero here, this is the southern hemisphere temperature change, global change and northern hemispheric change. We clearly observe that when we change the ice sheet uh, topography, the temperature increase in the southern hemisphere, globally, and in the northern hemisphere. This might be expected due to the change in the lapse rate. If you reduce the topography, obviously you have a warming due to the reduction in the lapse rate. So we take 1,000 years and the analysis is done only in the last 100 years when we assume that the climate is almost in equilibrium, as you can see here. Equilibrium for us is just defined as when the model has a cycles and the cycle does not change substantially in the simulation, the seasonal cycles. Okay, let's see what's happening globally. This is the present day climate simulation and this is the anomalies, the West Antarctic ice sheet minus present day simulation. What you can see is it, it, uh, when we change the West Antarctic ice sheet, we have a global warming. And this global warming is at most part of the Earth, is statistically significant at 95% level, as you can see in the, by these dots here. However, in the North, in the North America and, and, and Eurasia, we have the warming, but it's not statistically significant. But it's interesting that you have almost one, between one, 0 0.5 and 1.5 degrees everywhere in, uh, on Earth, and around Antarctica, this can be four degrees. This is for uh, 32 meter temperature, okay? When you look for winds, what we clearly find is that we have a desintensification of the westerlies in the southern hemisphere, and we have an intensification of the subtropical jet. This is really interesting because the, an intensification of the subtropical jet will induce a weakening and a block situation around South America, like here. That is the condition that is happening now in Brazil, that we have a very strong drought in the southeast part of Brazil. It's because this change in the subtropical jet does not allow to the cold fronts from this region to come to the southeast part of Brazil. So in this situation is happening now. So if you imagine that the West Antarctic ice sheet can collapse in the future, this would be very much the situation that you could expect, uh, expect there. And in fact, in Brazilian media now, 
sometimes I people ask me about the paper that is if this the drought in Brazil now is associated with the the sea ice loss in Antarctica. I say no, not yet. Yeah? But this is something that is now is happening here. Okay. In the northern hemisphere, by the, uh, on the other hand, we have an increase in the westerlies. This area here and a weakening in the subtropics here of the westerly flow. This is very much characteristic of condition that we have an intensification of the North Atlantic Oscillation when we have increased the uh, westerlies in this part of the Atlantic. It's like the, the balance between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere in terms of mass leads to intensification of the North Atlantic Oscillation. We can also observe this kind of pattern when you look for the anomalies in the geopotential height at 500. We can clearly see an intensification of the Azores height and a, and a weakening of the uh, Iceland, though. This change is not only occurring in the, on surface. It's also propagated upwards, as you can see here, in terms of winds, in terms of temperature. Most part of the westerly flow reduction does not, is not concentrated in the, in the, on surface, but is also growing in, in altitude. This is, might be expected based on the thermal wind relation that we have here. That's if you change the meridional thermal gradient, like the, the dy, this term is proportional. So since we have a global a southern hemisphere warming, this reduces the thermal contrast and also needs to change the wind field, lead to a reduction in the, in the vertical component. But there's something that should also be investigated associated with the Antarctic ice sheet. In this case, we just analyzed the southern annular mode. Because most part of studies say that when we, the southern annular mode is very stable, and the only thing that can change these variabilities associated with the shape of the Antarctic ice sheet. Not the height, but the shape. Since it is circular, annular structure, if not change this annular structure, the southern annular mode will be always the same way. This is, has been shown for less glacial maximum. We also find this. So the first thing is about the present day climate, where you can see here in the control run that the Speedo does a good job in, simulate the, in simulating this Antarctic oscillation. This is the uh, anomalies of the geopotential height at 500, regressed on uh, the first PC, regressed onto the climate anomalies. You can see here this high, the, this high pressure system here, low pressure in, in Antarctica. This is the temperature. Clearly depicted here is the warming in the Antarctic Peninsula associated with the positive phase of the Antarctic Oscillation, and also the strength in the wind field in the positive phase. So the model is able to, despite being very simplified, is able to reproduce the most important features associated with the positive phase of the southern and la mode. But what's happened when we change the topography? These are the anomalies between this regression and the regression characteristics of the Western Antarctic ice sheet simulation. And what we found here that is that when you change the Western Antarctic uh, ice sheet, we have a reduction in this pressure in the extratropical region associated with the southern annular mode. But we have an increase in temperature associated with the southern annular mode in the, in the Antarctic Peninsula when we change the West Antarctic ice sheet. So we have a defection of warm air to the region associated with this collapse of the ice. Okay? And when we change the West Antarctic ice sheet, what we also have is, is that a weakening of the wind field associated with the change in topography. In this sense, we can say that not only the mean climate changes when we change the Western Antarctic ice sheet, but also the main mode of climate variability is also changing. 
associate with the, with the, the Antarctic uh, ice sheet. But what happened also with oceanic changes? The, the advantage of using this kind of, of approach, a simplified model, is that we can evaluate not only the atmospheric components, but we can also try to understand what can happen with heat flux in the ocean, the thermal and circulation, and also it can happen in terms of the heat transport associated with the individual ocean bases like Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian. When you use a mod atmospheric model of higher resolution coupled to a, a slab ocean model or mixed layer model, we are assuming that the ocean has an infinite heat capacity. And any change in the atmosphere, in long term, will not change the ocean characteristics because this is only, only we change the face layers of the ocean. So by using this kind of approach, very simplified, we can try to understand what can happen in the deep ocean in terms of long time scale change. Similarly, what do we have for the uh, air temperature? The SSTs also changes. This is how a global warming associated with the SSTs. You can see here around Antarctica, the largest warming like two degrees. And we have found some place in the northern hemisphere that is getting cooling. This is very similar that when we see the IPCC report, we also found that some parts of the northern hemisphere gets a little colder for the, in the foot in the projections. And most part of this is associated with the changes in the convection sites. That is release a lot of heat to the atmosphere. And when we, ch we, we change the forcing, some of the characteristic place where deep water is forming change the position. So that's why we have this cooling in these areas here. Nevertheless, we do not have formation of deep water in the Pacific, only the Atlantic Ocean. This warming in the, in the, in the, in the global ocean also leads to change in sea ice. This is the sea ice anomaly associated with this change in the Antarctic ice sheet. We can see here that the ice thickness in the southern hemisphere changed by something like 0.5 meter. This is, leads to a shrink of the sea ice. And this is important because the sea ice is, uh, isolates the atmosphere from the ocean. And when the, the sea ice is less thick, it's not thicker as it, it is before, what's happened? The ocean releases more heat to the atmosphere. And this re release to the atmosphere can lead to a strengthening the convection because the water gets colder, more denser, and will uh, down well in, in, the, in, this, in this area here. Main the Weddell Sea and this part of Raw and Bellinghouse Sea, this part here. This is an important point because this will have a strong impact on the formation of deep water in Antarctica, as we can we'll see here. The change in, in the temperature is not only on surface and not is really on around Antarctica. What you can see is that the change in, in, in surface temperature goes to far north, like here. This is the anomalies in the global ocean Zonal average. You can see here that they, we have a global warming in this part here. What can be uh, what you can understand as some oceanic heat pumping to the atmosphere. When we look for the Atlantic Ocean only, we can see that this the warming is, is higher, is larger than compared with the in the global ocean, and more in the southern hemisphere. In, in Atlantic, we have a more stable Atlantic Ocean. This is remarkable because if the Atlantic Ocean is more stable, we do not have formation of deep water here. Because the water cannot, it goes from the Gulf Stream, gets very cold in the Cape Hatteras, release a lot of heat to the atmosphere, and increase the density, and they gas down. Nevertheless, if this part here is much colder, it's more stable, and you do not have this formation of deep water. So, and this will decrease the heat water, the, the deep water formation, and will lead to a cooling in the northern hemisphere. 
because we have, since we have not the water mass come from the equator, we have also a, this part of the Atlantic will be colder, and also you have colder in the Europe, like Scandinavia will be a little bit colder. If this is, if only the ocean is evaluated. So let's see what's happened now with the deep water formation. This is a stream function of the North Atlantic deep water. This is formed basically on Labrador Sea and in the Iceland region. This is, the, this is in, in Isverdrup, one Isverdrup is 10 to 6 meter, uh, cubic meter per second. And you can see here that we have something like 10 Isverdrup is coming from the Northern Hemisphere, going to the Southern Hemisphere in the North Atlantic. See? And is my amount of water coming from, the, from Antarctica to the North Atlantic underneath the North, water, uh, North Atlantic deep water. This is the Antarctic bottom water. This water is mainly formed by colder temperature, not by salinity, because the seawater around the Antarctic is very fresh. So this is mainly associated with changes in temperature here, so in this part here. The point is, when we change the topography in Antarctica, What's happened is this. We immediately, we have an increase in the formation of deep water. This is mainly associated, we believe, with the release to the atmosphere, to the atmosphere of heat due to the less thicker sea ice. That's the first point. I cannot say about pollinias because this model does not have pollinias. But since we have less thicker sea ice, this will allow to more heat to be pumped to the atmosphere. And the second point here is that when we have this less sea ice in this part here, we also increase the density of the water. Because since we are releasing heat to the atmosphere, the water gets a little bit colder. And if you get colder and you get more denser and you can get to lower layers. Since we have this formation here, what's happened in the northern hemisphere is that we do not have any more the North Atlantic deep water formation. Because this water is, is denser than the water in the North Atlantic. So this even will increase the ocean stability that does not allow for the North Atlantic water to be formed in this part here. So this is a very much characteristic of what we had during the last glacial maximum, and during the events that we call it like Danska Oshinga events, when you have this huge amount of, of, of fresh water in the North Atlantic and the Arctic that reduce the, the salinity and avoid the formation of deep water. So when we have the, this kind of changes, what we might expect is that the southern hemisphere, southern hemisphere will warm up, and the northern hemisphere will get colder because the heat transport change, as I will show here. This is the global heat transport. The red, the black, is for the control simulation, and the red one is for the ice sheet simulation. Negative values means that the heat is transported from the equator to the poles. In this case here, it's like we have southward, southward heat transport. This is, this is Global. This is the atmosphere part plus the oceanic part. Clearly, what we can see here is that when we change the topography in Antarctica, the heat transport reduces to Antarctica, the global heat transport. This is reasonable because since Antarctica is getting warmer, the atmosphere and the ocean, mainly the atmosphere, reduce the transport of heat to the south to try to equilibrate something like to, to take back the, the previous climate. Otherwise, that the uh, Antarctica will warm up all the time, and the tropics will be colder. So in terms of to equilibrate this, the heat transport changes. But what's happened in terms of the oceanic heat components? We can see here in black the global oceanic heat transport, 
something like 1.2 and 1.5 petawatts. Again, this is the, the zonal mean. We have in green the Pacific contribution to the global oceanic heat transport. In red, the Atlantic, and in blue, the Indic, Indian Ocean. What you can see here that both oceans, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean, contribute to, the, to heat transport to the south, as well as they, they contribute to increase the heat transport in the northern hemisphere, as you observe in the, in the global heat transport and also in the, only the oceanic part. Something that is very interesting here is that the Atlantic Ocean only contributes to heat transport in the, in the northern hemisphere. This is what they call it like heat piracy, northern, northern hemisphere heat piracy, because they take all the heat from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. So southern hemisphere sometimes were not lucky in, with this kind of thing. But anyway, this is what happens in terms of the, the Atlantic heat transport. But what happened when we changed this, this topography in Antarctica? The, heat, the oceanic heat transport will also change. Let's see what, what we found. When Antarctica, a West Antarctica sheet is absent, the first thing that we observe is that all the heat in red Atlantic that should be transferred to the northern hemisphere is now concentrated in the southern hemisphere. There is no, the Atlantic does not uh, transport more heat to the northern hemisphere. And why this occurs? Because 7% of the heat transported by the Atlantic Ocean to the northern hemisphere is associated with the thermohaline circulation, with this meridional overturning circulation. Since the circulation now changes completely, most part of the heat that should be transferred to the northern is now in the southern hemisphere. And is also contributing to increase the temperature in the southern hemisphere. It's like a positive feedback associated with the West Antarctic ice sheet reduction. More interesting is that the Indian and Pacific Ocean now try to overcompensate this effect, increase the heat transport to the northern hemisphere. It's like you have a new deep water formation in the Pacific Ocean. This claim has been proposed by Dunsedov in 2011, say that when the, the deep circulation in the Atlantic is shut off, something appears in the Pacific to, to, to balance this, this change in the, in the in this oceanic future. So this is in part also responsible for the warming in the southern hemisphere associated with the West Antarctic ice sheet. But let's move a little bit more to see what's happened. Uh, in order to understand a little bit better what's, what's, what leads to this warming in the southern hemisphere, we compute the storm track dynamics. And this is the, conv the, the convergence of the meridional flux, temperature flux, for control simulation, and these the, are the anomalies. What happens when we change the topography in Antarctica is that the heat associated with the storm tracks that used to be to the southern hemisphere, so, I mean the southern heat transport due to the storm tracks is also reduced. As you can see, this is negative. It means that the, this is transporting heat to the pole. But look what's happened when you change the topography. This is positive now. You see, I mean, less heat is transported to the southern hemisphere. Again, to reduce the temperature in Antarctica, to keep the climate in equilibrium. I mean, I'm not saying maybe equilibrium, but to try to balance the northern hemisphere. Similarly, occurs in summer and winter. Like the changes in the heat transport are associated not only with the ocean component, but also with the atmosphere. It's like both systems 
are working together to keep the situation stable. Because in, in this case, if the storm track dynamics are associated with the increase in the heat transport to, the, to Antarctica, Antarctica will get even colder, even warmer. Because more heat from the atmosphere and from the ocean were coming to Antarctica. Some consideration that we, we found is that is this, our results, in fact, if we look in terms of the global pattern, fits nicely with this reconstruction based in, in the ocean deal program in these two sites, as well as with this other one, and is also very much similar results that people has found in the Plyo MIP program. That is just is not just released, but it's a program that is starting. So it's, it's a very nice opportunity to 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 try to also evaluate what what they are doing in 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 terms of this. But what for the future perspective we have? For instance. This is the topography in, uh, in Antarctica, something like 35 million years ago. It's the beginning of the glaciation of Antarctica. We have all the East Antarctica sheet and a small part of the West Antarctica sheet on here. So th this is another experiment that could be done to try to understand the impact of Antarctic climate, Antarctica sheet on the global climate. Uh, nevertheless, we have a problem here. Because when we take out all this ice sheet, we need to change the albedo of the file. So it is not clear so far the Antarctic albedo because it's very variable. Can be, can be 50%, can be 75%. So it's difficult to find a, a, a correct value. So what we are using is something like 75 uh, when we have the ice sheet. But this is something like 30% because we have no ice, it's bare land in this case here, okay? Another interesting point that should be evaluated, that has not been done, although we have several studies that try to reconstruct the Enzo variability during the less glacial maximum, nothing has been done for Enzo in this inter, uh, 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 during this interglacial, like marine isotope stage 31 and, uh, and another uh, uh, interglacial periods. And this is a interesting plot because this is what is proposed, was proposed in 2004 by Frank de Boer. Uh, in the IPCC, this is the, a permanent El Nino state. I mean, when we increase the CO2, what is more, we ought to be more frequently is El Nino characteristics. Nevertheless, when we change the CO2, when we change the topography, uh, the global topography characteristic of the less glacial maximum, what we, you have is a permanent La Nina state. What we are planning to investigate now, based on a new simulation with a more decent model, is to reconstruct the Enzo during the marine isotope stage 31, was one million years ago. That's a period that is, can be very similar than what we can have in the next 200 years or maybe 100 years. I mean, a reduction in the West Antarctic ice sheet. So this is the new point that we, I think that we, we need to, to move on to understand this, this, this tropical characteristics and tropical teleconnections. How is this changed when you change the Antarctic topography? And this can only be done if you use this kind of a little simplified model because we have no time to, to use this very complex model uh, in, in global domain. Okay, thank you guys. I hope I was on only 20 minutes.